we praise you this morning. We give you glory. God, I'm so grateful that through it all, Lord, you've never let me down. You've never forsaken me, Jesus. God, we give you praise for that this morning. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Moses, 
David, Simon Peter, on and on we could go. And you know what they all have in common? They all failed miserably. They all made mistakes. They all sinned. Lost their temper. Lost control of themselves. Denied, did the one thing they said they'd never do. But they also have one other thing in common. And that was God was faithful. When they were not. I don't know what it is this morning, but as soon as Jenny, I mean, as soon as she started singing that, the Lord just came all over me. He just, he may not have been anywhere else in here, but he landed right over there. But not for a moment has he ever forsaken me when I deserved it the most. When everyone else would have or should have, God was faithful to me. And I want to draw your mind to a little, a little island that was for prisoners and outcast. There was a man named John that was there. And 60 years after he had seen the Lord over, he was there, and the Bible says he was there on the Lord's day. And the Spirit comes and is there and he sees this vision of Christ and he tells him to write for these words are true and faithful and he gets this vision the book of Revelation I won't go into it I won't take the time but as he begins to describe Christ one of the most interesting things of that scripture is he continually uses the word like like unto or as because he can't find the words to describe what it is that he's seen but what I want to mention this morning is this. I want you to imagine all that John had went through in all of those years since Christ, they had seen him ascend. The angels have said, you men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing? In like manner, he will come again. And decades had passed and decades had passed. No doubt there were days where John said, you said you were coming again. I've told the world that you were coming again. I've been faithful to you. I've preached your word. We've started churches. We've turned the world upside down. We've done all of this, and yet I find myself a prisoner, separated from my family, separated from the church, separated from the work. But God cared enough about that one to show up all those years later to let him know I've not forgotten where you are. I've not forgotten the promise that I gave you that I will be with you, even to the end of the world, that I will be with you. Why? Because God is faithful, that he will not leave us undone. He will not leave us alone, that even in the tough times, that as this song says, that he would carry us. He'll let us know that he's with us. I wanted to sing that. I've never done this. I've never asked him to sing more as far as a verse, but I feel that we need to sing that second verse again. And listen to these words. That not for a moment. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what you need this morning, but I can guarantee you this. Not for a moment, not for a split second, not for the twinkling of an eye has God ever forsaken you. He has been with you every step of the way. And He is with you even this morning. And He'll be with you even to the end of the world. He will see us home this morning. He is faithful. We'll be faithful to Him as she sings that verse again.
Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we praise your name and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you've never left us, you've never failed us, never forsaken us, never walked away, even when we deserved it, but you've been there with us every step of the way. God, we praise you. We love you. We glorify you this morning. God, there's times that I search for the words to show my gratitude, and I fall short. But one of these days, when I see you face to face, I'll be able to express for the first time what my heart feels. God, I just pray that you would continue to be in this service today. We ask your blessings on the remainder and everything else that's done. The song, dear Lord, the, the worship that is, that is to come. We pray for Elder Todd as he brings the word this morning. God, we just pray that you would bless and anoint and strengthen. God, we see something miraculous happen here today. Oh, glory. God, that you would come in whatever manner you see fit. We don't command you to come in a certain way. We just ask that you do. God, we'll accept you whatever way that you show up here today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And amen. Amen. You may be seated. As the ushers take their places, I just want to take a moment just to ask the Lord's blessing on this offering. Heavenly Father, as we lift this offering this morning, God, we just want you to know that we give from the heart. We give cheerfully. And God, we just pray that you would take it, do your work, bless it, use it, give wisdom on how it should be dispersed. And we just pray that you would bless it and see many souls added to the kingdom from what's given today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I'm sure you remember, our VBS is coming up in June. It starts June 24th. And we feed our volunteers and we give the kids snacks every night. And we are looking for donations. GFS has offered to get it all together for us. We just need some money donations. So look in the foyer today. There's going to be some people out there if you want to donate to VBS this year. I'm sure you've heard the old saying that someone's a mile wide and an inch deep. It seems in today's church culture, that's the trend, that there are people who know a lot of head knowledge about Jesus, but they don't have that intimate relationship with them that grounds them and roots them in the knowledge of God. On June 16th, Pastor Troy is starting a new series called Rooted, and he's going to show us and guide us through how to be truly rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, to have that strong foundation that when the winds blow, we don't fall. Be ready for Rooted on June 16th.
That is probably my favorite song right now. I heard that a couple weeks ago on the, uh, on the radio, and I told Petra, I said, you've got to learn that song, if for nobody else, for me. Because I'll tell you what, I've been there a few times where I felt like I had nothing at all left inside of me, and I needed help getting to the throne room to the Almighty. And I'm thankful for that time when we can lift each other up and we can take each other to the king, into the throne room where we can be ministered to and helped and revived and renewed in our strength. Hallelujah. I'm glad for that this morning. Praise the Lord. Well, we had a great vacation this past week and, and uh, Pastor and Mandy left last night after, uh, after the wedding and, uh, and, and went down to... Uh, where are they at? They're somewhere down on the ocean somewhere. And uh, uh, so they're down there this week. They'll be back for next Sunday service. So you're stuck with me this morning. But uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here, be home. We were, uh, last week we watched online and, and I'm thankful for technology uh, that we can do that. But there's just nothing like being back home. And uh, being with you all, this is a, a great place to be. Uh, whether you know it or not, this is a great place to be. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, if you uh, have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And while you're turning there, just kind of put your finger in there for a moment. And it was uh, the year of 1927. An S-4 Navy submarine was accidentally rammed by a Gulf uh, Gar or a Coast Guard cutter, and which sent it immediately to the, the bottom of the bay. And the entire crew was trapped, and every effort was made to, to free these men, but every effort failed. And near the end of the four-day attempt to bring these men back to the surface. A diver placed his ear to the side of the submarine and he heard a man tapping Morse code. And this was the last question that he heard from the man inside. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Listen, if there is a person that can answer that question that person is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ overcame death. He resurrected and is now sitting at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding on our behalf. That is hope, my friends. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus gives hope to all of us, and not just a hope that there is life after death, but also a hope that there is life today see we all need hope and that we all need to know that our that our life matters today and we need hope that our life can can and will matter tomorrow we we all want to know that our life matters and it makes a difference here on this earth and the the life will continue after our journey here is over see in other words every human being on the planet longs for significance and longs for lasting security and longs for hope and nobody knows that better than the, than the God who made us and and that is exactly why he sent his son Jesus Christ to give us hope today I, I, I want us to look at a passage of Scripture which I believe is one of the best stories in the Bible found in John chapter 11. It took place in a little village called Bethany at the tomb of a man named Lazarus. If you'll stand with me this morning for the reading of the Word. Because what Jesus said and what Jesus did at this cemetery forever drains death of its dread and forever empties the future of fear. I want you to get that this morning because what Jesus did at this cemetery forever drains death of its dread and forever empties the future of fear and it should give us all hope today. 
And I'm not going to read the entire passage, but just three key statements that Jesus made in verses 14, verse 25, and verse 43. Look at the first one in verse 14. Jesus said, Lazarus is dead. Verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And the last key phrase, in verse 43, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it is life to us. Your word gives us hope. And I pray this morning that, Father, your Holy Spirit would just help us in this place. That, Lord, that you'll walk these aisles. We give you permission. We give you right away to search our hearts today, Father. See if there be some uh, a, a wicked way in us that, God, that we need to turn over to you. Father, I pray that, that you'll do what you do best. And that is mend hearts, that is save souls, that is set the captive free. And in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus said in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. First statement that he gives us. First thing I want us to notice this morning in that statement is that we must accept the fact of death. We must accept the fact of death. Let me just summarize the setting and the background of the story here. Jesus had become very good friends with Lazarus and Mary and Martha, his sisters. Uh, they were like family. And in fact, Jesus would stay with them whenever he would come to Jerusalem. They were the best of friends. And at some point along the way, Lazarus becomes extremely ill. So his sisters sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick, thinking that Jesus would drop everything and immediately rectify the situation. But instead, Jesus deliberately delayed in coming. Lazarus dies. Jesus knew he was dead because he gives us the first of these three foundational statements in this story. In, in verse 14, he said, Lazarus is dead. You pretty much know he knew Lazarus was dead. So that, quite frankly, hearing those statements that somebody had died, somebody was dead, it's one of the most devastating statements you'll ever hear in your life about someone that matters anything at all to you. I'll never forget the first time I heard those words. I was 12 years old. The first person I really remember dying it was in near to me and in my life I was 12 years old that was my grandpa Pfeiffer man my grandpa and I were buddies I loved my grandpa Pfeiffer he uh, I remember every every Saturday they lived in the country and every Saturday back then you know they didn't have a lot of gas money and, and all of that so they'd come to town once a week and uh, uh, grandpa and grandma would come to town on Saturdays because they'd have to go to the grocery store and grandma would have to go to the beauty shop to get her hair done. That was just a give me. I don't care how far in the country you live, you have to come to town to go to the beauty shop. And that was an important thing for grandma. So every Saturday, grandpa and grandma came to town. And while grandma was doing her thing, grandpa would come up to the house and pick me up and I'd get to go running with him. We'd go to the Clinkers, and, uh, which, is our, which was the local uh, 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 hardware store, and we'd go just different places. He loved Friendly's uh, restaurant, so we'd drive to Col or Chillicothe and go to Friendly's, and he'd love their ice cream, and we'd get a hamburger and eat ice cream there, one of those Friendly Sundays, uh, and, and, and we'd eat that, and, and we'd visit on the way there and on the way drive back, and I just had a great time with my grandpa. I loved Grandpa Pfeiffer. But it wasn't long after I'd turned 12 years old that Grandpa developed cancer and it went quick with Grandpa. I think he lived about four months after, after they found the cancer. And uh, I remember going to his house and, 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 and visiting with him. He lay in the bed there and, 
and just spending time with him. See, Grandpa was my hero. Grandpa was so anointed. He was a singer. He played the guitar. And, uh, man, I'd love to go hear him sing. And, 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 and he, had, he sang with a, a guy by the name of Charlie Cartwright, and they were known as Cartwright and Pfeiffer. And they'd travel around, and they'd sing at large camp meetings. Back in the day when camp meetings were, were huge, and they'd sing to thousands and thousands of people. I remember I was about 10 years old. I was at Circleville Camp grounds there. There was a large camp ground there that, that, that people would gather into, and I mean by the thousands, and it, it was one of those open air tabernacles, and people would sit outside in lawn chairs and benches and on, on uh, blankets, and people would cram inside, and there'd be three, 4,000 people on that campground for the services, and I remember so vividly, I was 10 years old, and I, I was sitting there one, one service, and, and they announced that my grandpa and Charlie were going to be singing the next night. And the place erupted with shouting and clapping and all of that. And I remember sitting there thinking, that is so cool. That's my grandpa they're talking about. This was my grandpa. And I watched him lay there in that bed. Just dwindled down so quickly in his strength. Grandpa would go in and out of consciousness and He'd lay there and every once in a while he'd look up out the window and he'd wave. He'd say, do you see him? Do you see him? Do you see him? He'd wave and then he'd go back out. And he'd wake, then he'd come back too and he'd tell grandma. He'd say, I got a string missing on my guitar. I'm going to need that guitar where I'm going. You need to get that string fixed. And he'd go back out again. And he'd come back too and he'd start waving out the window again. See, that's my heritage. Grandpa knew what heaven was like. He knew where heaven was, and he knew Jesus was coming to get him. I remember I'd gone home, and Mom and Dad had taken me home, and they'd gone back to, to Grandpa's house to, to be with them. And I'll never forget them walking in the house, and I ran up and asked, how's Grandpa? And Dad's saying, Grandpa is gone. Grandpa was dead. Man, that hit me. Even that very phrase sounds cold. Somebody is dead. You know, we try to use other terminology such as passed away or, or expired or going on. But it all means the same thing. And I guess for the very first time in my life, the sheer fact of death hit me squarely between the eyes. And one of these days, that very phrase is going to be said about you and about me. You know, so-and-so is dead. James is dead. Jennifer is dead. Pam is dead. Oh, it sounds morbid because it is morbid. It sounds depressing because it is depressing. At least if death is indeed the final end of life. Uh, see, death is inevitable and, and, and the fact of death is certain. See, do you realize that human beings, we here this morning, are the only creatures that God made who know that someday we are going to die. And so we are the only creatures that he made who are desperately trying to forget about it. If you don't believe that, just bring that conversation up about dying in a, in a, in a group of people and watch them hit the conversational remote control button and begin to change the channel in their mind. Don't want to talk about that. Oh, no way. I'm going to live to be a thousand. Yeah, that's me. Don't talk about that. Don't want to hear it. See, we try to try in so many ways to put death out of our minds. And we don't want to think about it. Even companies do this. I mean, has it ever occurred to you that we buy life insurance instead of death insurance? I mean, the beneficiary can't collect it while they're living. They can only collect it once you are dead. But we call it life insurance. See, death is public enemy number one. And we do everything we can to avoid it. Buckle your seatbelt. Don't want to die. Use airbags. Uh, hey, you need to sleep more. Oh, you need to get out there and run. You need to go to the gym. You need to take your vitamins. You need to eat less fat. You need to eat more protein. Less caffeine will keep you alive longer. More veggies. You got to eat your fruit and vegetables. All of these things, on and on and on. Yet we all know that the cold hard fact is that one of these days, death is inevitable. 
It is inescapable. Euripides, the Greek poet, said, death is a debt that we all must pay. There are even people today who specialize in death. And they're called thanatologists. Thanatologists. And it comes from the Greek word for death, which is thantos. And amazingly, almost every college and university across this country offers a course or seminar on death, dying, and immortality. See, we all know it's coming. Ecclesiastes 8, 8 says, No one has power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit, and no one has power in the day of death. There is no release from that war. Psalms 89, 48 says, What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? I love the story of the wife who went with her husband to the doctor's office. And afterwards, the doctor pulled the wife aside and said, Hey, ma'am, I, I'm, I hate to tell you this, but your husband is deathly ill, and he's not going to make it. But the one thing that can help prolong his life is if you'll do these following things. She said, well, what can I do, doctor? And he said, well, listen, every morning I want you to get up and make him a good, healthy, hot breakfast. And you could even serve it to him in bed. Oh, that'll, that'll, that'll help him. And, and, you know, have him come home each day for lunch and give him a well-balanced meal. And, you know, if he's tired and his muscles are aching, give him a full body massage. That, that will help. And then make sure you feed him a, a good, hot meal for dinner every night. Oh, and listen, we don't want to overexert him, so don't make him do too many chores around the house because we don't want to over, overdo him that way. And I want you to keep the house perfectly spotless and clean so he's not exposed to any unnecessary germs and dust and those kind of things. And she's taking notes and writing all of these things down and in the car on the way home, the husband looks over at his wife and he says, Honey, what did the doctor say when he pulled you aside? And she said, Oh, dear, you're going to die and there's not one thing we can do about it. <laughs> <clears throat> Listen, you may be old, you may be young, you may be rich, you may be poor. You may drive a, Mar a, a Mercedes or you may drive a Pinto, but you don't need a doctor to tell you that someday you are going to die. But see, here's the problem. The problem is most of us refuse to think about it until it is too late. And that's why so many live hopeless lives, lives of fear, lives of depression, thinking that this life is all there is to it. It's just hopelessness. Hopeless. Hopelessness. See, we must accept the fact of death. Secondly, we will experience the force of death. We'll experience the force of death. Jesus purposely delayed in coming because he wanted everyone to know that Lazarus was definitely dead. And when he finally makes his way back into Bethany, Martha runs out and meets him outside of town. And look, she is not real thrilled at all with Jesus. And in a very irritated fashion, she says this in verse 21, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Ah, words like that have been echoed a million times down through history. Lord, if you would have been here, my son would not have died. Lord, if you would have been here, my baby would have lived. Lord, if you would have been here, my marriage would wouldn't end it. Lord, if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. Lord, if you would have been here, that wouldn't have happened. See, if you sense a little bit of disappointment, even a little aggravation in Martha's voice, you'd probably be right. She was having a hard time understanding why Jesus had, made it his, had not made it his top priority 
to get back in time to heal her brother Lazarus. She questioned his compassion. She doubted his goodness. And just like many of us have done or will do before our lives are over. All of us have experienced some dying in our lives that we question why. Why them? Why now? But let me promise you this this morning. The presence of death does not mean the absence of God. The presence of death does not mean the absence of God. And after hearing Martha out, Jesus makes the second of these three key statements in this chapter in verse 25. He says, Mary, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And then he goes on in, 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 in verse, 50, or verse uh, 26. And everyone who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Amen. See, these two statements seem to contradict each other. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will live even if you die. And then he says, if you believe in me, you'll never die. Now, which one is it, Jesus? See, you have to keep two kinds of death in mind here. And you'll understand what Jesus meant. In verse 25, Jesus is talking about physical death, which is separation of the soul from the body. In verse 26, he's talking about spiritual death, which is the separation of the soul from God. See, one of these days, Todd Kritzweiser's body is going to die. But listen, I am going to live even when my body ceases to function. How? How is this possible? Because I believe and I have put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ. And I, the real me, is going to live forever and will never die. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me put it to you this way. It's impossible for anyone who personally has a relationship with Jesus Christ to die spiritually. And if you're a true disciple, follower of Jesus Christ, and, that, and you want to meet a person who cannot die, all you got to do is look in the mirror. Because what we, what we call death when is when your body ceases to function. But the body dying and you, your soul and your spirit dying, are two completely different things. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. See, the greatest single miracle that Jesus Christ ever performed was when he raised, G raised Lazarus from the dead. Amen. See, we learn why Lazarus had to die. See, everybody else wanted a healing. Jesus wanted a resurrection. Everybody else wanted their brother, their friend back. Jesus wanted a miracle to take place. See, and I want you to learn this this morning. And hear me if you hear nothing else. God sometimes allows what we see as bad so he can ultimately give us what is best for us don't you hear that God sometimes allows what we see as bad so he can ultimately give us what's best for us which is why the third point this morning is the most powerful point of all and that is, we can escape the fear of death. We can escape the fear of death. See, after Jesus ha has had a talk with, Mary, with Martha, and then with her sister Mary, he asked to be taken to the tomb of Lazarus. And they assumed that he wanted to go and pay his respects. But when he got there, he makes an amazing statement in verse 39. He tells the men there, remove the stone. Ah, even to this day in Israel, gravesides are, are, are carved into the hillsides, and the soft limestone is, is carved away, and, and dirt and rock is removed, and the body is placed in the hollowed out 
tomb and a large stone will be used to place in front of it to, to protect the, the body from animals or, or from uh, 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 grave robbers and those kind of things. And when Jesus uttered these words, man, you could have heard a pin drop because everybody was staring in amazement. Why would Jesus want to look into a tomb and see a mummified body? See, in that culture, they didn't have the embalming elements like we have today. And when a person died, they would wrap the body in spices and then wrap him up literally just like a mummy. And Lazarus at this point had been dead for four days. And so by this time, he was beginning to probably smell pretty bad. So everybody there was trying to figure out why in the world was Jesus telling them to remove the stone on this tomb? Jesus begins to pray, calling on God to answer his prayer. And then he shouts out three words that sent chills down the spines of everyone standing around that tomb, which gives us the third key statement. He said, Lazarus, come forth. See, even as those majestic words hung in the air, check this out in verse 44. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Oh, I tell you, I'd have give anything if I could have had a front row seat on this day. At first, uh, they, they saw nothing except a, a black hole and the darkness of death. And then I can imagine somebody standing over here saying, look, look at that. There, there's movement there. And they, they saw something moving toward the, the opening in the doorway. And, you know, I, I'm reminded of the story of the three buddies who... Uh, we're in a car wreck and they all three died and they went to heaven and they're they're going through orientation there and 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 they were all asked this question what are or when you are in your casket and your friends and family are mourning you what would you like to hear them say at your funeral and the first guy said oh I'd like to hear them say he was a great doctor a great man he was a real family guy and the second guy said, oh, I'd love to hear them say he, he was a wonderful husband and a great school teacher and he made a huge difference in the lives of children. And the last guy said, hey, I'd like to hear them say, look, he's moving. <laughs> See, Lazarus was moving. He was alive once again. And listen, my friends, Jesus Christ has the power over life and death. And this is why we must put our faith and our hope in Him because nothing that you do or nothing that you go through or you ever face is too much for Jesus to handle. You got marriage problems, you need to take that to Jesus. You're dealing with depression and grief and mourning and sadness, you need to take that to Jesus Christ you need to turn over that to him because he can handle it better than you ever thought about praise God praise the Lord and listen when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead he was also giving all of us a dress rehearsal of what is it's going to be like in that last day because one day there is going to be a worldwide grave evacuation and the dead in Christ are going to rise and then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together forever to be with the Lord hallelujah I'm looking forward to that day I'm going to heaven. I'm going there when I die. Hallelujah. I'm going to heaven in the sweet, sweet by and by. Angels place my order for a mansion and a crown. Hallelujah. I'm going there someday. Hallelujah. And you can too if you'll put your faith and your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. See, you see, what Jesus did not only liberated Lazarus, from the bonds of death but he also liberated Lazarus from the fear of death look at John 12 John 12 I think you have that on the screens here chapter yeah verse 9 
The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there, talking about Lazarus. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. See, isn't that amazing? Everybody came from miles around to see the dead man walking. He is telling everybody what Jesus has done for him. And the Pharisees are wanting to kill him. Now listen, do you think Lazarus was worried about the Pharisees' plan do you think Lazarus was worried that they were talking about killing him? Do you think Lazarus was worried about dying? Look, the Pharisees said, Lazarus, if you don't quit witnessing about Jesus Christ, we're going to kill you. You're going to die. Look, Lazarus just said to them, look, guys, been there, done that. I've already done that. I've already been dead, but thank God I'm now alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And listen, that's what Jesus wants in your life. I'm talking about spiritually now. Jesus wants you to die out to the flesh and die out to all of this junk that we hold on to. And he wants you to kill that so that he can resurrect you back and you can have a life full of joy and peace and, and, and just the things that he can bring into your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what we need, church. Not hopelessness, but there's hope in Jesus. When we surrender our all to Him, there's hope in that. There's life in that. Praise His holy name. You see, Lazarus knew that. He knew his, that his significance and his hope lay in the fact that God loved him so very much. And he need no longer fear death. Because God had taken care of that problem for all who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. See, the one who performed that unforgettable miracle with Lazarus later went to the cross. He later hung there between two thieves, shed his own blood, and died, paying the ultimate and complete penalty for your sin and my sin. Listen, Jesus, too, was wrapped in burial clothes. Jesus, too, was placed in a grave. He, too, was sealed with a stone. Oh, but three days later, he was alive never to die again. You talk about hope this morning. Because of the resurrected Christ, we can have hope. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But now, the question to you is the same question that Jesus asked Martha 2,000 years ago. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? A few years ago, Tiger Woods won the Masters and was holding at the same time all four major titles to what's known as golf's Grand Slam. And he was asked in a press conference what he would say to the great golfer Bobby Jones if he were to walk into the room. Of course, Bobby Jones has been dead for many, many years. And Tiger Woods said, I would ask Bobby how he came back. Because when I go out, what I want to know is, how can I live again? I've got the answer for Tiger Woods and for any of you wondering that same thing in this room today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will find out that death does not have the final say. Jesus Christ has the final say. Hallelujah. He's conquered the fear of death. He is the only hope. He is the resurrection. This morning, I believe Jesus is standing in this room. He knows your heart. He knows what you've gone through. 
He knows where you've been. He knows the hurt. He knows the sorrow. He knows the sin that's binding you up, got you all wrapped up. And he's standing here saying this morning, your name, and he's saying, come forth. He's saying, come forth. He speaks your name today, and he says, come forth. Let me loose you so that you can have life. Let me unwrap you of all the stuff that you're bound with and give you hope and give you life. Come forth. Father, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would move in this place. I pray, God, that today we will have Judgment Day honesty. Whether they're sitting in this room or watching online, God, that you will search our hearts. See what we're bound with, Father. And may we not hesitate to run to you, to be loosed, to be liberated, to gain our freedom. With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. I wonder this morning if you're here and you say, Todd, I need Jesus. I need him in my life. You've been feeling that tug at your heart. And you want to be honest this morning and say, hey, I, I need him. Anybody like that here today? Just say, I, I need Jesus. I see that hand. I need Jesus. I'm going to pray for you. I need Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and, man, you're wrapped up in stuff. Maybe you've got bondages in your life, drugs, alcohol. Maybe you're dealing with depression, sorrow, grief. You're saying, man, I need loose from this. Listen, he is the joy that can, that can help you in your depression and in your time of need. He is the healing that you need to take place today. Let's all stand together. And as we sing one verse of this song, I want you to bravely and boldly step out. You either want him or you don't want him. You either want the help or you don't want the help today. And someone will pray with you and believe with you for your need. Just as I am without one but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to morning just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me and that thy I just pray right now that your Holy Spirit's going to meet the needs of everyone here at this altar. I'm thankful that Jesus saves. 
I'm thankful that Jesus heals. I'm thankful that Jesus sets free. And this morning, Lord, I just ask you to do that in each of these lives. Oh, do what you do best, Father. Set the captive free today. And then, Lord, I pray for those that did not respond this morning. Lord, I just pray that your conviction will stay upon them. And that God, maybe even on the ride home today, they'll cry out to you. And Lord, they'll ask for forgiveness. And Lord, you'll save them right there in their car. Maybe at home this afternoon. Or maybe they'll even come back here tonight, Father, and pray at this altar. I just pray, God, that you'll stay with them. May you draw us, Lord, continually to the foot of the cross. And Father, I pray a special blessing on every family, every, every couple, every child. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, go with us as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, that all God's people say amen. 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 God bless you. Hope to see you tonight at 6 o'clock. You're dismissed.